I'm really excited to bring up an old friend uh, and the Dallas Cowboys head coach, Jason Garrett. Let's talk. <laughs> How are we doing, guys? Okay, so we start off every team meeting with the Dallas Cowboys with that question. How are we doing, guys? And uh, when I get that really tepid response that I got from you guys, I just keep asking it over and over and over again. Okay, so how are we doing, guys? All right, very good, very good. Uh, hey, hey, it's, it's a real privilege uh, for me to be here today. Dave and I have known each other. It's 35 years now, which seems I, I can't even imagine. That game was... 25 years ago. It's hard to believe. Um, it seems like yesterday. It goes fast. And I try to remind myself of that to try to be great today, try to take advantage of every day that we have. And uh, again, it's certainly a privilege uh, for me to be here. Uh, I, I want to talk today about, about team. Um, when I was in seventh grade, my dad was a football coach, so we moved around a lot. We lived in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. And then in seventh grade, we moved to Cleveland. We moved to Cleveland Heights, Ohio. My dad was coaching with the Saints, and then he was coaching with the Cleveland Browns. He was an assistant coach. And uh, we went to the school called St. Anne's in Cleveland Heights. And I'll never forget, Mrs. Stellman was my, uh, was my science teacher. And literally the first day of science class, she said, okay, everybody break up here. We had about, I don't know, 24 kids in the class, six groups of four. We kind of go over in the corner. Hey, we have a science project due here in about two weeks. I want you guys to discuss what you're going to do and everybody take a role in it. And, and, and here we go. And, and then before you know it, the class was over. We're changing classes, going to another class. And I, I went home that night and, and, and my parents said, you know, it's a new school. How, how did it all go? And I said, it's kind of easy to be honest with you. You know, I'm used to school where you kind of sit in your desk and the teacher talks out and you raise your hand and whatever. And she split us up into these groups. And it wasn't even like we were in school. Like we're kind of pulling the wool over Mrs. Thelman's eyes. And I reflect back on that later, the wisdom of Mrs. Thelman. You know, kids, you know, 11, 12 years old, grouping up, groups of four, groups of five, groups of six, whatever it was, to do a project. It's kind of what life is, right? It's what life is. And uh, I've thought a lot about that, and I've thought a lot about the teams I've been on in my life, the teams that you guys have been on in your life. Uh, I'm probably close to 200 in my life, starting with the, the, the Monmouth Beach Tidal Waves. I was six years old, it was a Cap League team on the Jersey Shore, a town called Monmouth Beach. And, uh, and just a ridiculous number of teams since then, sports teams. Uh, football, baseball, and basketball my whole life, summer baseball, men's basketball, played for the school, played CYO, played all this stuff. And then I, I've had the good fortune to kind of continue, you know, in, in high school and college and beyond that, to be on teams. And, uh, but it's not only sports teams. Uh, I have seven brothers and sisters, we're all a year apart. We moved all over the country because my dad was a coach. That's a team. If you think about, you know, if you're involved in some community organization or something at the church or something at your, your, your company, we're always grouping up into teams. And uh, for many of us, if you really think about it, it's, it's well over 100, maybe 200 varieties of teams that we've been on. I'm part of a team now, 2019 Dallas Cowboys. Right. It's really it's a football team. And, and I think about every day what makes up great teams. I also think about what makes up bad teams. I've been on both. I've been on teams that have won the Super Bowl, won the championship, all of that. I've been on teams that won four games. Uh, maybe the same guys, same kinds of guys on those teams. Why is the one the best in the world? And why is the other one among the worst in the league? I think about that stuff each and every day. It's my job. Um, the three components that make up great teams, they have strong leadership, they have a committed, motivated workforce, and they have a thriving team culture where healthy team chemistry exists. Well, that's pretty simple, right? Every team we've been on, strong leadership, committed, motivated workforce, the people, and then the environment that you live in, you work in, you play in. Okay, so I'm going to take a shot at, at, at kind of uh, breaking these down for you and, and really just sharing some of the things that I think about in my job and hopefully it can relate to some of the things that you do each and every day in all parts of your life. Um, let's talk about leadership. If we had a conference on leadership, it probably could last a week. 
There's so much stuff on leadership out there. It's such an important topic in every industry, in every sport, in all walks of life. Uh, it's probably, if you go into Barnes & Noble, uh, and you go over to the section about self-help, there's more leadership books there than any other topic, right? Business. It's all about leadership, leadership, leadership. And I understand why, because it's critical. It's critical. Um, there are so many components to leadership, if you think about it. Um, I'm not going to get into each of them, but if you think about the best leaders we've all been around, they're authentic. I played with Troy Aikman for eight years. He's one of the best leaders I've ever been around. Hall of Fame quarterback, won three Super Bowl championships. I can't tell you how much I admire this guy. But if I went into the huddle and tried to be Troy Aikman, the rest of the guys in the huddle would look at me like, come on, get the hell out of here. What are, you, what are you doing? You know, Troy Aikman needs to be Troy Aikman. I need to be who I am. Dave Corey needs to be who he is, right? You can learn from other leaders, but you have to be authentic. You have to be authentic. Leaders have to lead by example. Leaders have to have a vision for where they want to go, a plan to put it in place. They need to be able to communicate. They need to bring the energy. They need to hold the standards high. It goes on and on and on and on. I think about this stuff really each and every day. Uh, but before you get to any of that, I think there's something more important than that. And I'm going to relate a story to you from 1992, my first year with the Dallas Cowboys. Dave was gracious. Uh, when I finished college at Princeton, I wasn't drafted. I was a college free agent hanging on by a string. I played with the Saints for a year on their practice squad. I was in Canada. I was in San Antonio. I was trying to be a pro football player. I wasn't doing a very good job of it. Okay? It's about three years into this thing, I get a chance to sign with the Cowboys. I'm the fourth quarterback. And we're playing our last preseason game at the old Texas Stadium. It's the end of August, and we're playing the Chicago Bears. And if you guys follow pro football, the last preseason game is the one where Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith, Michael Irvin, all the really good players, they don't even put their shoulder pads on. They have ball caps on, they put their jersey on, and literally they're eating hot dogs on the sidelines. Okay? For the rest of us, the guys like me, I'm trying to be the third quarterback. It literally is the most important night of my career. I'm going to play the second half of the game, and I do it or don't do it. Okay, if we play well, I got a chance to be on the team. If I don't, I probably never play football again. Okay, so Aikman's a good buddy of mine. I'm like, can you just kind of cool it with the hot dog? I mean, it's kind of a big night for me, you know? So I get a chance to play in the second half of the game. And uh, I'm playing with guys who are exactly like me. We're all hanging on by a thread. The coaches are literally, in the next 48 hours, going to make a decision on our professional fate. And so I go in with guys like me, and the one exception was the guy who was playing right guard for us, a guy named Kevin Gogan, who actually turned out to be my roommate. Gogan was an established player. If Gogan walked in that, room, th that door right there, you would say, that's the biggest person I've ever seen in my life. He's, he's probably six or seven years in at the time. He's six feet seven, six feet eight. He's 340 pounds. The biggest head you've ever seen in your life. Arms, hands, the whole thing. And literally no one on the planet wanted to eat the hot dogs more than Kevin Gogan, okay? <laughs> but Gogs draws the short straw. There are other guys that are hurt, so he's got to play. And all he's got to play, he's got to play with us. You know, the kind of the, 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 the bottom rung of the roster. So we go in, it's the second half, we get the ball literally on the minus one yard line. Minus one means the goal post is right here. We got 99 yards to go. It ain't a good place to start. So I get in there, I got all my guys, here we go, we're gonna, we're gonna get going here. We run the ball a little bit, we make a first down, make a couple throws, we, you know, two or three, four first downs, we're out by midfield. I'm feeling really good about it, there's a timeout, I go over to the sidelines, I come back in, we got a minute or so before we're gonna start, so I'm in there kind of leading the guys, all right guys, what, what snap count do you think we should go on? Should we go on a hard count or a quick count? What do you guys think? And Gogan's looking right at me, he's looking kind of down at me. And he says, hey, red ball. Red Ball was my nickname. He said, hey, he said, hey, Red Ball, you're the quarterback. You decide what snap count would go on. It's a dagger right in my heart. Happened 27 years ago. I, I can't tell you how much I remember this. I have like a visceral reaction. Hey, Red Ball, you're the quarterback. You decide what snap count we're going on. It's the number one lesson in leadership. Leaders need to lead. I'm the quarterback. I'm the guy that gets in the huddle, call the play, I go to the line of scrimmage, I'm the voice they hear, and all of a sudden I'm making this, this, this democracy. What snap count do you want to go on? I'm waiting for the right guard to tell me what snap count we're using. 
when you're in a leadership position, lead. Lead. That's the number one thing about leadership. There's all those other things that we can get to. We can talk about them all week long, right? When you're in a leadership position, lead. I think about it every single day in my job. I sit in my office, lead. Are you leading or are you managing? You're kind of making sure everything's okay. Are you leading the troops? Are you leading the coaches? Are you leading the players? Are you leading upward to ownership on the same level? Two guys down here. Are you a servant? Lead. Lead. Leaders lead. That's line one. Grasp the mantle of leadership. Jimmy Johnson was the coach of that team. Jimmy Johnson was a great coach, uh, Super Bowl winning coach, national championship winning coach in college. He's going to be in the Hall of Fame at some point. I played for him for two years. There wasn't one minute of one day that I and everybody else in that organization didn't know who the leader was. He was the leader. I worked for Nick Saban for the Miami Dolphins for two years. He's won six national championships at Alabama, arguably the greatest coach that ever walked. You can make a hell of an argument for it. There wasn't one minute of one day that I and everybody else in that organization didn't know who was in charge. Okay? Leaders lead. Grasp the mantle of leadership. And you don't need to be in a leadership position to lead. We all can lead. We lead ourselves. We lead people around us. We have a positive impact on them towards the goal we're trying to get to. That's what leadership is. Okay? So that's where it starts. Okay? We can get into some other stuff as we go. Uh, what's the second part of great teams? They got great leadership, strong leadership. They have a committed, motivated workforce. What does that mean? Okay? The people. The people who are part of it. They're committed to it. And they're motivated. Dean Smith, the great coach at, at University of North Car Carolina for years, the only criteria that he had is I, 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 want, I want motivated basketball players at the University of North Carolina. Okay, you can tell me about all the other stuff. You better be motivated. You better want to be great. Committed, motivated, committed, motivated workforce. In our business, it's coaches and players and staff members. Are they committed or are they motivated? A few years ago, 19, uh, excuse me, in the 2016 draft, Ohio State had a ridiculous number of players coming out in the draft. And we had a poor year the year before, and we had the fourth pick in the draft. And so that, if you guys follow football, Joey Bosa, Ezekiel Elliott, they had literally 15 guys who were going to get drafted. So we decided, we're picking as high as we were, that we we're going to fly a group of people up to Ohio State and spend a day with these guys, with all these guys, talk to their coaches, work them out, get meetings with them, find out about them, who they are. And so we fly up on a Friday morning. I grew up in Ohio. I'd never been to Ohio State. I'm embarrassed to say that. I'd never been to, Ohio. I'd never been to the football facility at Ohio State. So we grew up, there's, there's a group of 10 of us. We go in there on a Friday morning. And I walk into the football facility. It's kind of a glass entryway, two-story atrium. And I, and I walk in, and, and there was just something about it. There was a little bit, it was like a, something in the air. And I look down at the floor in this entryway, and there are all these great words, excellence, champion, determination, perseverance, all kind of engraved into the floor. And, you know, in a leadership role, you're always thinking about how you message things. Boy, that's pretty good right there. I kind of like that. I kind of make a little mental note to myself. We're going to do that. We're going to do something like that. I know that. And uh, so I kind of keep walking around. And at eye level, there's all these great pictures of all the great Ohio State players all through the years. They had great history and tradition there. Archie Griffin won the Heisman Trophy there in the 70s, two years in a row. And Eddie George, I can go on and on and on. The number of guys who played at Ohio State who were first round picks, great players, they're all up there. They're all depicted at eye level. So I'm like, ah, this is great. I mean, got the stuff on the floor here. They got the images of all the great ones. This is fantastic. For whatever reason, my eyes were kind of drawn up to the top of this two-story atrium up on the wall above us. There's a quote, four words. You win with people, Woody Hayes. Woody Hayes was the great coach at Ohio State who built this tradition. He was there for 25 years. Coach of all the great teams, coach of all the great players. And I just kind of stopped in my tracks. All these great images around me, and I looked at that one, I'm like, huh. You win with people. It didn't say you win with talent. It didn't say you win with scheme. One of the all-time great coaches has a chance to put a quote up there, and the quotes that chosen is, you win with people. And the suggestion is people, who they are, what they're all about. 
And that's really what we're there for that day, to find out. We can see the tape. We can read the statistics. What's Ezekiel Elliott all about? What are these guys that we're thinking about bringing into our organization? What are they all about as people? Do we want to bring them into our team? I always think about it. Okay, if we're doing Jason and Jim's pizza, okay, do we want this guy? Do we want him with us? Okay, forget about how fast he is, how high he jumps, all that stuff. Okay, who's the guy? Who's the guy? If, if you looked at our draft sheets, uh, we have evaluated all the players coming out in the draft. We evaluate all the free agents, all the guys on other teams that, that we could potentially bring. We do an evaluation of them. And if you look at that sheet, where it starts is on the top, makeup, character, personal character, football character, work ethic. It goes on and on and on with all these traits that we're looking for before we get into how long their arms are, how fast they run, how many catches they had, how many sacks they had. It's about who they are. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. The makeup and the character matters. You win with people. You win with people first. And then we'll figure out how talented they are and how to use, how to use that talent. Uh, we think about this constantly. We're always bringing people in. You know, Dave said it. We, we, we have 90 guys on our team right now. We're going to cut them down to 53, bring 10 guys back. We're always evaluating guys. It's constant. It's 365 days out of the year. We're always trying to do it better. Uh, about five years ago, we took our team. We have training camp out in Oxnard, California, and we're playing the San Diego Chargers in a, in a preseason game. So we decided to head down to San Diego a day early, and we spent a day in Coronado, California with the Navy SEALs. Uh, we got to know those guys, and they were going to do a little presentation for us, for the coaches and for the, and for the players. So we head down there. I had never been there before. We have all our players and coaches in warm-up suits. We got 90 players. We got 25 or so coaches and staff. So we're all in there. And if you guys have never been there, it's an interesting place. When I thought about Navy SEALs, I thought it was going to be kind of state-of-the-art, the best of the best. The facilities are going to be off the charts. You kind of pull in, it's a little bit raggedy, a little bit rusty. You know, there are potholes, and it's just, it's just not kind of what I thought it was going to be. And we're actually hanging out in this armory-type hangar, their team meeting room, if you will. And, and literally, they're picnic tables and picnic chairs. We're sitting there, like out of a school cafeteria, and there's, some of them are rusted out. It ain't real fancy. And so the whole thing was supposed to start at 9 o'clock, and we get there, and we got all our players in our warm-up suits, and they're sitting. There's a little bit of a buzz there. I was sitting down on the right-hand side. And this is going on for whatever, 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, for whatever reason, it starts to get quiet. And uh, in the back of the room, the door opens. And there's this guy in a stark white uniform. Bald head, and he just was shiny. He was shiny from head to toe. Shiny head, he had, this, he had his hat in his hand, shiny belt buckle, shiny shoes. He had more medals than I've ever seen in my life, creases in his, in his sleeves, in his pants. And he kind of walks, I'm in the side here, and he walks down the back, and all our heads start to turn. And he stops in the middle, as if to say, I'm here. And there's like, hush. Everybody looks at him, he starts to walk down the front. And it became quiet. By the time he got to the front, it was, it was, it was deathly quiet. And I bet he was probably, I don't know, 5'9", 165, 175 pounds. Wasn't physically imposing. But with all those pro football players in there, many of whom are 6'5", 315 pounds, the biggest, strongest guys you've ever seen in your life, if you ask anybody at that moment, who do you take? Everybody would say, I'd take the bald guy. <laughs> I'd take the bald guy. He was just this intimidating figure. And he turns around and he says, uh, Take it easy, boys. I didn't get dressed up for you. I got a funeral to go to after this. And everybody was like, holy shit. You know, I was like, <laughs> okay. So everybody kind of sits up, and he starts to talk about what the SEALs are all about and what they do. And uh, then he kind of explains the day. We're going to take the coaches over here. We're going to take the players over here. We're going to show you around. We're going to talk about the SEAL ethos and, and what the Navy SEALs are all about and maybe how it can relate to what you guys do. So then it's ready break, okay? They go their way. We go our way. And 15, 20 minutes later, we find ourselves out on the sand. You can picture where the Navy SEALs go. You guys saw the movie, Lone Survivor. It's that place. It's exactly that spot. 
Um, so we're kind of up on the bank on the beach, and it's 25 coaches just standing there. We're watching two groups of seven potential Navy SEALs going through their exercises. And one, uh, one group has this rubber boat. You guys have seen this thing. There's seven of them, and they're holding it over their head. And they have their whole Army uniform on, their Navy uniform on, fatigues, boots tied up. They get, they're wet, they're sandy. It looks as uncomfortable as uncomfortable can be. And they're holding this boat over their head. And here they are, they're holding it, and they're holding it, and they're holding it. And then they get down on their knees, they hold it over their head. Then they put it on their head, they sit down, they still hold it, they push it up, down. They put the boat to the side. Okay, they go down, they go swim out 100 yards into the surf, around a buoy, they come back, they roll around, they run down the beach, they come back, they swim out, they roll around again, they come back to the boat, here they are. Group of seven of them. I'm like, huh, this is interesting. Next to them, seven more guys. Same outfit, same getup, same completely uncomfortable uniform, wet, sandy, the whole deal. But these guys have this big telephone pole-like log. And they're doing the same damn thing. They're holding the log over their head. They're holding it like this. They're holding it like this. They put it on their shoulder. They bring it back up. They put it on their shoulder. They put it on their head. Kneel, sit, put it down. Then they take it and they start doing crunches together. Yeah, then they put it down. They go out, swim out, come back, roll around, run down, come back, swim out, come back, back to the log. So we're just standing there watching this. We're watching these guys do their whole thing. These guys do their whole thing. 15 minutes. 20 minutes, 25 minutes. No one's really saying a word. The guys are barking at them, the whole deal. And I'm just thinking to myself, every one of these guys looks exactly the same. Every one of these guys is 5'8", 5'9", 5'10". They're 165 pounds, 175 pounds. They all seem to run the same. They all seem to swim the same. And they told us earlier that they got about 250 to start, and they'll probably have less than 20 that they keep. I'm just thinking to myself the whole time, how do they pick? How do they decide who stays and who goes? And the guy, the guy, the bald guy, the guy who runs the whole show, Timmy as hell, is standing next to me. And this is just going through my mind. I'm like, we got 90 guys in our team right now. We got to get to 53. We got to bring 10 back. But like every day they reveal themselves to us. This guy's just faster. Every time we throw the ball to this guy, he scores a touchdown. This quarterback completes all the passes. This guy makes every tackle. We're going to have some tough calls, but it reveals itself to us like every day. We know that this guy's going to be around here. This guy's got a chance to be great. This guy probably doesn't have enough. You know, we'll get to the hard decision, but for the most part, it's pretty revealing. And all I'm thinking about is how do they pick as I watch these guys do the same things over and over and over again. So after about a half an hour of this, I finally muster enough, uh, uh, enough courage to kind of turn to the guy. And I said, uh, Sir, can I, can I ask you a question? And I go through that whole thing. We've got 90 guys on our team or whatever, but it kind of reveals itself to us. You've got 250. And you have less than 20 of them at the end. But they all look exactly the same to me. They're all the same size. They run the same. They swim the same. How do you decide who stays and who goes? And he kind of looks at me with a little bit of disgust. <laughs> and he says, uh, we keep the ones who keep their arms straight. I was like, huh? Sorry, sir, I don't want to follow that. <laughs> you keep the ones who keep their arms straight? Explain that to me. He said, do you really think we use the rubber boats? Like, we're on a mission. Do you think we use rubber boats? Do you think we use the log? We don't use this stuff. We do this stuff for one reason. To find out the guys who are going to keep their arms straight. Look at them. Every one of them, they've been doing this for an hour. Every one of them shaking like this. Every one of them shaking. We sit there and watch them. Who are the ones who are mentally tough enough not to give in? Everybody wants to do this. Who are the ones who are mentally tough enough to keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting as they go through this? What we find out is the ones who are mentally tough enough to keep their arms straight when they got a boat and a log are the ones who are mentally tough enough to get their job done regardless of what the circumstances are. They're mentally tough enough to make sure we accomplish the mission. And most importantly, they bring themselves and their buddies home with us after we've accomplished the mission. We keep the ones who keep their arms straight. And he walked away. I feel like it was yesterday that I was having the conversation with the guy. 
I think about it like every single day. Let's keep the ones who keep their arms straight, right? You're talking about committed, motivated workforce. Every one of us are going to get confronted by things. We're going to be challenged by things. Maybe not physically, rubber boats, logs, swimming, running in the sand, right? But we're going to be challenged by adversity. The NFL in life is all about adversity. We got to keep the ones that keep their arms straight, who are tough enough to keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting fighting through it all. Those are the kind of guys you want on your team. We think about that a lot. Okay, so it's great leadership. It's you win with people. The kind of people are mentally tough enough to keep their arms straight. Those are the guys you want. Those are the guys you want. Okay, so when you get these guys, what do you do with them? What do you do with them? I've been talking about Cleveland a lot. When I was a senior, year, uh, senior in high school, I had to take wood shop the spring trimester of my senior year. And it was the last class of the day. And Mr. Howarth was the wood shop teacher. And Mr. Howarth was central casting. You were making a movie, you need a wood shop teacher. Howarth's your guy. Uh, he's kind of a legendary figure at my high school. I was taking this thing pass fail. I didn't have to do much, but I was going to go there, kind of. Fulfill the requirement. So I go, it's uh, eighth period, and I go on the first day, it's a Monday, and Mr. Howard, very, he's got tremendous enthusiasm for woodshop. And uh, he kind of meets me at the door. Mr. Garrett, so happy that you're in the class. What do you want to make? What do you want to make? And a buddy of mine, basketball buddy of mine, had made like the greatest Nerf basket ever in woodshop the previous trimester. So I was determined to make a better one. So I want to make one of those Nerf baskets, wooden, Wooden rim, we'll put a net on it, we'll paint it up. That's what I want. That's fantastic. Mr. Garrett, that is fantastic. Okay, here, just go over there to the corner there and, and grab some wood and uh, we'll draw it up, we'll, we'll cut it, and, uh, and we'll get to work on it. So I don't know what wood to grab, so I just kind of grab some wood and we're going to make a fan shaped backboard. And so I get a Sharpie out or whatever it was and we'll kind of draw what it is and come on over to the saw. So we go over to the saw and we cut the thing. I'm not very mechanically inclined. So we cut it, we cut it, we cut it, we come out of it. When we, when we pull it out of the, the saw, it, it ain't real good. Um, it's a little lumpy over here on the right hand side. Mr. Howarth, uh, enthusiasm has not been dampened one bit. He says, that's okay, Mr. Garrett. Go over there in the corner there and, um, and get yourself one of those files. And just work on it. File that baby down. This thing will be great. So I go over. It's Monday. I go over there. I'm in the corner. I'm 10 minutes into my wood shop career. Um, I go over in the corner and I start filing it down. And uh, spend the rest of that day filing it down. I spend Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday filing it down. I spend the next week uh, then I filed it too much, so I had to file the other side and sand around. I had more stuff that I, that I had to do over in that corner. I come in the third Monday. Howarth meets me at the door. He says, uh, Mr. Garrett, Mr. Garrett, you are really nice, a really nice young man. Um, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed having you in the class, but we have some serious woodshop students in here, and I know you're taking this pass fail. You don't have to come anymore. I'll give, you, I'll give you a passing grade. You don't have to, you'll have a free eighth period and it'll be good. Um, but you don't, have to, you, don't have to, you don't have to come to class anymore. So I was like, and I didn't know what to do. I just got cut by wood shop. <laughs> and so I was like, ah, oh, okay, great, great. Uh, I grabbed my backboard that was still misshapen and I kind of walked out. I tell the story to our coaches all the time. I didn't know what kind of wood I was picking, and I was bad right from the start. I made a misshapen backboard. And I spent two weeks trying to shape it, shape it, shape it, shape it, shape it, shape it, shape it. And then the guy who runs the whole show, who makes the decision, came up to me and said, you're a really nice man, but we're going to give somebody else your chair. So what's the lesson? Make sure you know what kind of wood you're getting. Pick the right people. And then when you get them, get it right, right from the start. Get it right, right from the start. So you're not playing whack-a-mole with this team that we're trying to build. Or you're all out of whack and you're just trying to play catch up and shape it and shape it and shape it, but you screwed it up right from the start and that might just prevent you from ever being what you want to be. I talk to our coaches about that every single day. We've got 30 new players in. Let's bend the twig every day. 
bend the twig. If they start going over here, let's shape them right. Let's get them right. This is how we meet. This is how we walk through. This is how we practice. This is how we handle ourselves in the cafeteria. This is how we handle ourselves in the locker room. Shape them, shape them, shape them. Bend the twig. Get them right. Get them right. Let's not wait three months and the guy's all out of whack. He's got this big lump on his backboard and we're trying to shape him then. It's kind of too late. It's kind of too late. So you got the strong leadership. You got the right kind of guys. Now your job is to shape them. Shape them and shape them right from the start. We talk a lot about what the expectations are, what you can expect from us, what we expect from you, and what we're looking for. That's day one. That's the day one message. So we're abundantly clear. And then we can shape them into that, into that mold. Okay, I got two more quick stories for you. Um, 1965, there's a guy named Robert Rosenthal. He's a psychiatrist goes into a school, an elementary school in California, and he does a study uh, on 50 kids, 50 elementary school students in one class. And they give them, he gives them an IQ test, first week of school. And he tells the teachers after they get the results back from the IQ test, which 20 students were about to bloom based on the results of the IQ test. Comes back at the end of the year, he gives a different IQ test to the same 50 students. Turns out when they get the results back, the 20 students who are about to bloom perform significantly better than their classmates. After the second test, Rosenthal tells the teachers that he chose the 20 students at random after the first test. One of the most important pieces of leadership, coaching, and teaching that I know. He chose the students at random after the first test. He told them, these 20 are about to bloom, they're about to blossom, they're about to be great. So consciously or subconsciously, the teachers treated them differently. They believed in them more. They challenged them more. They set the standards higher. Because Jimmy's going to be great. Jimmy's going to be great in math. Sally's going to be fantastic. The teacher's pushing Sally to be better to be better, consciously or subconsciously, believing in her, you can do this. Give her a harder question, she responds to it. And so we talk about this literally every day as coaches, this idea, this idea of higher standards, higher expectation leads to higher performance. The 20 students who were chosen randomly after the first test, but were treated differently by their teachers, responded and performed significantly better. So that's our job. We're creating this thriving environment, this culture that we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. Get the right ones in there. Be abundantly clear at the outset what the expectations are. And then push the standards, put the expectations as high as can be. And they're going to respond. They're going to respond. 1996, the, the American Baseball Coaches Convention was in Nashville, Tennessee. And the keynote speaker is a two and a half day convention, the last guy to speak. This guy named John Scalinas, 78-year-old baseball coach from Cal Poly Pomona. Been there for 40 years. Nobody outside of baseball knows who this guy is. Everybody inside of baseball, they, 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 were, they couldn't have been more excited to hear him talk. So he's the last guy. The place is packed. There's a buzz in the auditorium. Scalinas comes in the back door. He's got a Cal Poly Pomona warm-up suit on. He's got a home, a home plate on a rope strapped around his neck. He walks up to the podium just like this. He does 20, 25 minutes on pitching, hitting, base running, fielding. Doesn't say a word about the home plate. He's a fantastic speaker. 4,000 people in the audience, standing ovation. When the whole thing quiets down, he steps away from the podium. He said, I bet you guys are wondering why this old baseball coach has a home plate strapped around his neck. Probably think I'm getting ready for the loony bin. And then he says, uh, how, many, how many Little League coaches do I have out in the audience? They raise their hand. He says, how wide is home plate in Little League? The little whispers, somebody in the back says, 17 inches? 17 inches. How many Babe Ruth League coaches do we have out there? How wide is home plate in Babe Ruth League? 17 inches. High school coaches? 17 inches. Minor league coaches? How many minor league coaches do we got out there? How wide is home plate in the minor leagues, 17 inches. Major league guys, 17 inches. He says, say for instance, you got a pitcher. We'll call him Billy. 
You love Billy. Billy's a great guy. You love him. One of your favorite players. And he's a really talented pitcher. Really talented. But Billy can't, can't throw the ball over home plate. He's wild. He's erratic. He asked the, the major league guys, major league guys, what do you do with Billy? Talented guy, great kid, but can't throw it over the plate. What do you do with him? He says, I'll tell you what you do with him. You ship him to Pocatello, Idaho. You get rid of the guy. You can't throw it over home plate. He says, what you don't do, what you don't do is say, we really like Billy. Billy's a great kid. He's fantastic. I love the guy. Really talented, too. So when Billy pitches, I know he's a little erratic. When he pitches, let's, let's, let's not use that 17-inch plate. Let's use the one 18, 19. Hell, we love this guy. Let's use the 24-inch plate when Billy pitches. Why can't we do that? He said, you can't do that. Nobody's ever done that. Yeah, he said, why then that same guy, Billy, guy that you love, great kid, really talented guy, why then when you have a no facial hair policy on your team and Billy shows up with a beard, why then do you kind of look away and lower the standards for him there? Why, when practice starts at 3 o'clock, same guy, Billy, love him, great kid, talented player. He shows up at 3.07. You kind of look away. Jump out in the outfield, Billy, you're all right. And lower the standards there. So he goes on in the talk and says, from Little League to Major League Baseball, home plate 17 inches wide. That's the standard. That's the standard that we all have, that we have to hold ourselves accountable to. And he challenged everybody, himself included, Okay, to keep the standards high for him and for everybody and for your players. Keep the standards high and hold yourself accountable to those standards. Some things are universal, they ain't changing. And so I shared the story with our team a few years back and everybody got a 17 inches t-shirt. Blue t-shirt, white lettering, 17 inches. To remind ourselves, to remind me as the coach, I love this guy. He was late for the meeting. He needs to be held accountable to it. Yeah, he didn't know his assignment. He needs to be held accountable to it. And so Scalene has challenged everybody in the room to hold themselves and everybody they're associated with to the highest standards possible, because ultimately that's what matters most. So you can have all the other stuff. You can have the strong leadership. You can have the committed, motivated workforce, the right kind of guys on your team, the guys who keep their arms straight, all that stuff. You can have the highest standards, but standards and expectation without accountability mean absolutely nothing. So when you talk about building a thriving team culture and healthy team chemistry, ultimately it's going to come down to that. If I, as the head coach of the Cowboys, allow one player to do one thing, another guy to do another thing, oh, he doesn't have to do conditioning, he doesn't have to lift, all of a sudden they're looking at me like, are you kidding me? Why am I lifting? Why do I got to be here early and stay late? Why do I got to play every step? You have no chance. You have no chance. And I find that if you pick the right wood, you choose the right guys, it's easy to keep the standards high, the expectations high, and the accountability high. That's what they want. That's what they want. And ultimately, they have a chance to be a part of something they can be proud of for a long, long time. That's the day one message. We're building a team we can be proud of for a long, long time. Okay, I'm going to finish with this. It's my favorite story. I think it's a great story for life. I think it's a great story for team. Um, it's, a, it's a story about this Buddhist monk friend of mine who's running. And he's running and running and running and running and running. He doesn't know why he's running. He's just running. He looks back behind him. He sees these lions and tigers are chasing after him. And he's running as fast as he can, as fast as he can. They're getting closer and closer and closer. Before you know it, he finds himself at the edge of a cliff. And the lions and tigers are getting closer. He looks out over the edge of the cliff. There's a hundred foot drop. And there's snakes slithering down below. He looks back behind him. Here come the lions and tigers. Looks out over the edge of the cliff for the drop and for the snakes. Next thing you know, he goes over the edge of the cliff. And as he's falling, he looks up, he sees the lions and tigers, he looks down, he sees the snakes. There's a branch coming out of the side of the cliff, he grabs onto it. He kind of takes a breath. He looks up and sees the lions and tigers, he looks down, he sees the snakes. All of a sudden, the branch starts to get a little rickety. He looks at the base of the branch, sees three rats gnawing away at the base of the branch. Okay? Up at the lions and tigers, down at the snakes and the three rats. For whatever reason, his eyes are drawn to the other edge of the branch, where he sees the most beautiful bushel of strawberries he's ever seen in his life. He becomes completely mesmerized by them, and he reaches out, and he devours them. That's my story. You guys like it? 
Okay. <laughs> What's it all mean? What's it all mean? I probably tell our team this story two or three times a year. The guys have been around me for a long time, like, oh, not the strawberry story. <laughs> it's a really, really important story for life. It's an important story for football coaches, football players, and really anybody who's trying to be part of something and living a life that can be proud of. We all have things in our, in our past, right? These lions and tigers, things we have or haven't done. Okay, they're always chasing us. We all have this anxiety about what may or may not happen in the future, the snakes slithering down below. And sure enough, we all have these rats kind of gnawing away in our everyday life, don't we? Every one of us does. But hopefully we all have something else, people we love and things we love to do. And I challenge our players and coaches every day, and I challenge myself to become focused and mesmerized on these things. Forget about that. Don't worry about that. Sure as hell don't worry about these guys. Okay? Get locked in on the people we love and things we love to do. Okay? And devour the strawberry each and every day. That's my message. Good to see you guys. <laughs>